And that's why the most important thing is what I just said. Ha ha, you can just get All right, turn this on. On. Yes, there we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, if you're watching online, there are literally 200,000 people here right now. Yeah, fans, every one of them. Only funny if you went to church today. We're looking at Philippians. We're starting in verse 12 of chapter 1 today. So Philippians 1, 12 to question mark, because who knows where we're going to end. Excuse me. Um, this is some good stuff we've been looking at. And uh, we took last week off because we had our big meeting. But to bring you up to speed and to re refresh everybody's memory, Paul is in jail. He's writing this letter from jail. He's writing it to the church at Philippi, who he has a deep, deep emotional connection with. The letter is not instructive like the gospel or like the Romans where he's just laying out all the deep points of the gospel. It's not corrective like Corinthians where he's saying this is a problem you need to fix it. Instead, this is just a letter and it has a completely different form. But what we find out as we read and read and read through it, it's kind of a formula for how joy works. And we talked about that two weeks ago. But we begin in verse 12. He says this, I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me really has served to advance the gospel. Thank you. I mention this because some people don't understand it. When Paul writes brothers, is that men or women? Oh. No, when he wrote it, it oh, was really? men. Oh. It was just men. You know, because there are times when he talks about sister so-and-so or brother, you know. The reason why Paul wrote it brothers, is the church at the time was primarily men. Just like Judaism at the time was primarily men. The women were Jews, but they didn't do religious teaching. So there was definitely a gap. The funny thing is your religious heritage to be a Jew is determined by your wife, or your mom, I mean. So it's, it's through the mother's lineage. But all of the teaching happened to the men. They would gather, they would learn, and then they would go back to their lives and they would try to put it in practice. And what happened in some of the churches, and, and I don't think we'll get to this verse because it's not Philippians, but at one point Paul says, women keep silent and receive instruction at home. And now some people have taken that to a run with it and say, Paul's anti-women. Or the church is anti-women, and that's not the case. What was happening for the very first time ever is women were being fully included in the life of faith. So the women were allowed to learn, read the letters, come. But what would happen if you had never heard the stories? Because you were never allowed to go to class. So the new Christian teachers are saying, as our forefathers taught, Abraham took his son. And the, the women are in there, he was Abraham. Which son? Where'd they go? They're asking questions. And it's disrupting public teaching. So what Paul said in that verse basically is, anybody that doesn't know, remain silent and get caught up at home. Ask the questions at home. Don't create, because it's right in the middle of a verse about orderly worship. If you were going to make a big gender smackdown, you wouldn't bury it. You would say, I firmly believe all men are dogs. You wouldn't bury it in a verse about, you know, whether the chair should be in a row or in a column, or whatever. So Paul is including women in the full life of the church. It was, it, it was the first time it was ever done. No religions at the time, no temples. Um, so this is a big thing. But when he addresses brothers, it's a male word, but he, he's also including the women in it. That's why you see a lot of new English translations will say brothers and sisters. And there's nothing wrong with that except that the word is only brothers. And I want you to know the, the words that are there. Uh, it's Adolf Weiss. It's, it's truly brothers. And we, uh, we get the word Philadelphia, um, city of brotherly love. Um, so he's, he's telling them, basically, church family, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to him? What's the big thing that's happened to him? Jail. Jail. Paul is under arrest. Now, how many of you enjoy the times you've been arrested? 
I'm sure most of us have happened multiple times, right? Um, no? No? Most people have. You're right. Most public leaders at the time had never been arrested. Um, it was not common. It wasn't acceptable. But this is what has happened prior to this. Word had spread throughout most of the Roman Empire about why Paul had been arrested. And we're going to get into that. But he is saying this, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Quick review, gospel. Anybody know what that is? Good news. Good news. Yep. The good news particularly of Jesus Christ. The good news that he came, he died, was buried, and rose again. And that is good news, and it's earth-shattering news, and people were having a hard time hearing it, especially the Jewish establishment at the time. They were, they were saying things like, well, that, that can't be true. Uh, what? And, and it was frustrating and confusing at times. And so the Jewish leadership got people riled up and said, you know, Paul is causing public problems. And we talked about the very first week as an intro, Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, Rome had had an unprecedented multiple hundreds of years of peace in their empire. And so they took seriously these little rabble-rousers in certain towns that would get people fired up, whether it was against Rome or not, and they would say, hey, this isn't okay. And when it came to the Jews, they clamped down on it very, very quickly and said, hey, this has got to stop. So um, he's in jail. And most of us wouldn't say that would be the best way to advance the gospel. Very few would say, you know what, I hope our pastor gets arrested because that's just going to bring him a prison ministry like no other, right? Nobody would, please don't wish that on me. Uh, some of you are prayer warriors. I do not want the prison ministry that way. But what he's saying is it has served to advance the gospel. Now, here's why. So that it, what's it? It's not a hard question. The gospel. The gospel has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. And to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, some early translations translated praetorium as a place, the palace. But if you know anything about royalty, you have one palace, not multiple palaces. Palaci? Palestine? I don't know. You, you don't have more than one. Because you don't have more than one king. You don't have more than one emperor. And so there was one emperor, and the people were worshiping him. If you remember, the cult of the emperor was growing in popularity, and you had to say, uh, Caesar is Lord. And he has a guard called the Praetorium. Um, they were the elite of the elite. Now, way before this time, you couldn't have soldiers in the city of Rome. It was against the law. And at one point, uh, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, which is a river in Italy, and you had to keep your troops on that side of the river to keep peace. And he brings his troops into the city of Rome. How many of you have heard the phrase crossing the Rubicon as a phrase meaning, you know, they, they, they can't go back. They, they've made a commitment. Or from the sermon this morning, they're all in. Caesar crossed the Rubicon with his troops, and he could no more say he's going to peacefully uphold the way Rome had been, and he changed it. And once you've done that, you want to protect yourself. So he had his praetorium. The praetorian guards were elite, like I said. There were um, nine cohorts of a thousand men each, and they rotated. Sometimes they did business outside the city of Rome, where the emperor said, I am sending them to do this, and they'll be there for a while, and then they'll come back. But basically, 9,000 highly trained, most powerful guards that are around the emperor at all times. They were charged with his protection. If the emperor were hurt, they would lose their lives. They got double the pay. Who wants to sign up? Oh, yeah. I mean, if I'm going to take a sword, I'm going to take a sword. Why not get double the money? But they would most likely have been killed if the emperor had been killed. And they guarded Paul because he was going to be testifying before the emperor. And so he's in a house, probably in Rome. He's being guarded. And they get to hear the gospel. Now, see, that's the thing. I, I don't want to go to jail. 
And, and if I did go to jail, I don't know that I'd be an effective witness. I don't know if I'd really be that guy that would be like, hey, jailer, uh, when do I get my morning coffee? And speaking of coffee, Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee. and he, you know, but, but Paul even uses his occasion of imprisonment as a chance to advance the gospel. Now, if he'd been your standard criminal, if he'd been a rapist or a murderer or an extortionist or a thief, nobody would listen to him, right? I mean, that's the thing. There are some Christians, you look at them and you're like, hey, you can get off our team. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you should not be saved, but please stop telling everybody you're part of our team. You're hurting us. You know, the guy that does horrible, horrible things and then tells everybody, oh, I'm a Christian, I go to Lake Union. <laughs> no. Um, we had that happen to a waitress when we lived in Florida. Uh, she wasn't a bad person at all, but she told me she had a Bridges pen. Our church was called Bridges. She had one of our pens that she gave us to fill out the receipt. And I said, oh, that's interesting. What is that? And she's like, that's my church. And we'd been up for almost three years at that time, meeting every week. I said, really? Oh, I love Bridges. Hmm. And she's like, why? Well, I, I'm the pastor there. No, 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 you're not. No. I, I went on opening weekend, and the guy had really long hair. He had longer hair, and he didn't look like you. And I'm like, it's me. <laughs> and she's like, oh. And so I, I, t I asked her, I said, why, you know, well, I work every Sunday. I can't go to church, but Bridges is my church. She listened online, and she downloaded the messages sometimes. And, and there was somebody who was claiming good stuff and was being a good witness because she really did believe. But sometimes people seem to take the name Jesus and then live badly. Paul wasn't that, and that's all I'm trying to say. Because it's easy in our modern American context where so many people have been part of the justice system for better or worse, either they're police or lawyers or criminals. It can be easy to assume that if you're in jail, you have a certain taint about you. Paul didn't have that. They knew he was in chains for Christ. They knew he was there because he'd been proclaiming the gospel. And it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, take that phrase, the rest. He's not just preaching to the elite guards. He's talking to everybody. Everywhere he goes, every chance he can, he's sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. But... He's figured out something that we need to figure out. There are times when you're going into a new area or you're trying something new, it helps to talk to the influencers first. It's not showing favoritism. It's not chasing the wealthy. It's not saying that the gospel is only for the powerful or the elite. But if his jailers and the guards had been against him, do you think he'd have had the chance to talk to anyone else? No. No. He knew that. We know that. So he made his case first and foremost to those who would be controlling his movements and his freedom. And he, he got them on board. Now, they might have not accepted Christ, but they got the idea that he's in chains for Christ, not for crimes. And it goes to all the rest. Now, verse 14 begins this way. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. We can camp out on that for a couple of minutes. Um, how many of you have ever become more bold because somebody got arrested for doing what you want to do? Hmm. Not so much. Like if, if in Florida especially, there are all these bridges and all these little things you could fish off. And it said, no fishing. And then it had the little state or county rule that you know said that. And uh, you'd see somebody every once in a while fishing. And then you'd see somebody come along and tell them to move along. And if they didn't, they got arrested. Because it's a huge problem. You know, it, it causes, are you okay? Oh, <laughs> that man on you? Okay, I'm sorry. I just, I care. All of a sudden she's like, <laughs> <laughs> she's becoming bold. <laughs> but you'd see somebody get hauled off, and never once did I go, since he was arrested, I'm going to fish more. Yeah, no. If you see somebody go down for something, you're more likely to go, okay, that's in my don't column. <laughs> and Paul's saying clearly, they're more bold to speak the word without fear. And fear is a great word. Um, it, it's not just like, we fear winter in the, in the summer, right? We know it's coming, and it's probably not going to be as great as everybody wants it to be. This isn't that. This is like fear of spiders or snakes. 
You know, like where you're just looking around and you see it and you have that gut, and you want to run. That's the word that he's using. Gut-wrenching fear, and, and they are without it. They are literally, um, all, all you have to do in Greek is put an A in front of it, and it means completely without. So they're without fear. They have no fear, not for their lives, but for their willingness to speak the word. Now, in this series we're doing, Not a Fan, we talk about the stakes being raised. We talk about being a, not a fan, but a follower of Jesus. And you sometimes come to that question, what would I do if Christianity weren't legal? What would I do if it really was going to cost me something to stand up for Jesus? And in this case, he's talking to a group of people who absolutely have to be afraid of that. If a Roman guard or a soldier on the road asks to see your book that's been stamped that you have pledged allegiance to the emperor as God, and you don't have it. He can make you say in his presence, Caesar is Lord, and then he'll stamp your book. And if you don't, and you're not a Roman citizen, you could get killed. If you are a Roman citizen, you can get put in chains. So this isn't like, well, now, like, if you witness at work, the cool guys aren't going to like you. Or if you make a stand for Jesus, um, you might not get that promotion. This is serious, like life and death stuff, and that's who he's talking to. And his imprisonment has emboldened the other believers. Now, would we take confidence in that? Would we say, because I see what God's doing in the Apostle Paul's life, I'm going to do it more? I don't know that we all would. And it can be hard. Now, I'm cold. Someone said this. If Christianity were made illegal, would anyone be able to find enough evidence to convict you? That's a tough one. Another story, um, and I told this joke to my friend Josh down in Florida, and he's like, Pastor, do not do that here. And I'll tell you, you'll see why in the end. This, uh, the church is about to start service. Two guys burst in the door with automatic weapons black masks over their head. And they said, anyone that will claim the name of Christ, we will kill you. If you don't believe in Jesus, run. And a bunch of people got up and left. Took out the mask, turns out they were the deacons. And they said, all right, pastor, the hypocrites are gone. Let's start church. <laughs> now, we will never do that here. You don't do that post 9-11. But Josh is like, half the people at our church are carrying guns because of Florida. And I'm like, don't worry, we won't be doing that. But what if a gunman did break it? What if ISIS targeted Lake Union? And they said, you say Jesus, I'm going to shoot you right here. If you say Allah, you live. Would we claim the name Jesus or would we follow Allah? Now some of us might rationalize it and go, well, clearly oh, I can say it to them. That doesn't mean I believe it. But would we stand up for it? Would we put our life on the line for the name of Christ? It's a tough question, and the one I hope we never have to answer at the point of a gun, but if we answer it just to answer it, I think we can move forward in our faith better. Let's keep going in verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ. Now, again, you just got to go back to 14. Bold to speak is preaching Christ. They're not bold to speak about the latest trends in agriculture. <laughs> they're speaking the word of God, and they're testifying to Jesus Christ. So Paul says, some indeed preach from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. So let's just divide the people who are willing to speak into three camps. Envy, rivalry, and goodwill. I'm going to let you in on a dark, dark, dark secret. Pastors are incredibly prone to to the numbers game. When pastors get together at conferences, no one has ever approached me and I've never approached anyone else. Hey Jack, how's the health of your church? No, what do they ask? Is it growing? Hey, how many people? Mm -hmm. um, my friend Nate Hoff, hi Nate, you might watch this someday, um, he would just infuriate people at, 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 in Seattle because when they, they would say, how many do you worship? And what they meant is how many people are in attendance at worship. He's like, just one. 
we worship Jesus. And they're like, you know what I mean? And you'd say, yeah, but I'm not going to get into that. But pastors tend to compare numbers. And, oh, oh. And, and we, look, we look so pious and sincere when somebody says their church isn't growing. Oh, so you, oh, it must be a tough time for you. And we walk away going, yeah. <laughs> winning. Ours is growing. Yay for me. That would be envy. I'm envious of his growth or her growth, and I want that. So I'm going to preach the word. Now, that's the wrong motive. You don't want to grow your church so you're bigger than your buddies ten states away. Rivalry is the second camp. That's when you do it at the local ministerial meeting. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm so sorry. That family left your church? And in the back of your head, you're like, i got to call Bob. <laughs> Bob is church hopping. And um, there's a phrase that you learn in church planting circles. No church has ever been successfully built by shuffling sheep. I, got to, I didn't move out here, buy a house in Annandale, and commit to doing what I'm doing to shuffle sheep. I don't want to take three from that church or four from that church, and then look, we grew. Seven people are now living a different life. No, seven people just go to a different place on earth. I want seven people to go to a different place for eternity. I want seven people who didn't know Jesus to know Jesus. I want seven lost people to be found. And actually, I'm not happy at seven. I'm not happy at 70. I'm not happy at 70 times seven. Some of you will like, well, how big does Lake Union have to get before you're going to be happy? As soon as you can decide which of your neighbors don't attend a church that you're willing for them to go to hell, we can shut the door. As soon as you got that figured out. If you're not willing, then we're never big. There's always room for more. There's always room for more grace, more gospel, more love. And honestly, I'll tell you, and this is the first time a couple of our leaders are hearing this, Nothing would make me happier than if we planted a church from this church in a year or two, if God willed it. If we said, you know what, a lot of people are coming from that area. We're going to be the first covenant church in Maple Lake or whatever. Because it's not about envy. It's not about rivalry. It's not about Pastor Mark. And it's not about you guys. It's about Jesus. And it's about more people hearing the word of God. More people hearing the good news. Because let's face it, we were full this morning. There were like eight seats, and they were dying of loneliness because they weren't even connected. There were people there were people in the front row. Whoa! <laughs> and not even the kids. There were real adults in the front row. So I pray to God that I will always be the third group that Paul talked about, but others from goodwill. I want to preach from goodwill. I want to preach from a spot where I say, I've been saved. I've been redeemed. And I want others to find the Savior. It's not about numbers. It's not about whether or not so-and-so knows or that this happened or that happened. It's, it's about, I want to preach from goodwill. I want to preach from that place where I'm just delighted because God saved me and I want to tell other people about it. Now, he says this, the later or the latter, depending on where you were raised, do it out of love. The latter are those who are preaching out of goodwill. It is out of love. When I find somebody that doesn't know God, I want to talk to them about God because I love them. I love them as a created child of God that God made in his own image, that he died to save. And uh, Paul's addressing the people that are doing it there. He says, the later do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So what they're doing is they're actually taking boldness, like he said. They're saying, Paul's in jail for this. I'm stepping up. I got to tell you, friends, there's nothing more exciting when the church steps up. When I did go down hard in Florida because my intestines ruptured and I was in the hospital for nine days, I got out on a Thursday and I preached on Sunday. But I did it from a chair. We literally put an easy chair on the platform. It took me 15 minutes to walk to the chair from my car. And, um, I mean, it was just brutal. And then, the, you know, the church service started or whatever, and I walked up again. And, um, I told the church, I said, this is Bridges 2.0. I got us this far. You have to take the ball now. I'll still be your pastor, but I can't do everything, print everything, find everything, and decide everything. And in that church service, I, I, I literally, in the message, said, who's willing to do this? And people stood up and said, I'll do that. I'll take that. 
they were emboldened because I was imprisoned not behind bars but behind the fact that mm -hmm. I was dead almost. I literally almost died. Uh, somebody asked me about a month after that, they said, so you're pretty well recovered? I'm like, no, not even close. They're like, really, why? I go, well, most mornings I get up, barely make it to the kitchen to make coffee, and I get the coffee and I go sit down and fall asleep <laughs> without even drinking the coffee. I wake up and it's still hot and I'll have a cup and then I make some food and then it's, it's noon and I'm an early riser. That's how wiped I was. Just anything was killing me. But the church grew during that time. It's not about Pastor Mark, it's about Jesus. And it's about the people that stepped up. Some of them were my friends, some of them became my friends, some of them were people I barely knew but had said, I wanna, I wanna build something here. So the later do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, and what are those again? Envy, rivalry. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my prison imprisonment. Can you imagine that if Paul got that letter? Hi, Paul. I know you haven't done very well in the uh, Oxbow neighborhood of Rome, but I've got a hundred converts now. Enjoy jail. <laughs> I mean, that would just be a horrible letter to get. You'd read it. Thanks. And they didn't even send food. <laughs> Remember, you had to raise your own support. As a, as a, that's. I mean, our our criminal justice system has come a long way. You're in jail, and you have to find your own food. Good luck. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment, rivalry and envy. They're trying to hurt Paul. And I've seen that sometimes, not just ministers, but even church members. When, you're, when your church is going and growing and blowing and everything's just happening on all eight cylinders, and then you talk to somebody else and you're like, oh, that's cute. You had 20 people show up. Oh, that's nice. Your little church. The word little has never been said in America as a compliment, except when you're talking about people getting smaller for health reasons. And, and people do it. And it's the thing where you go, I didn't say anything. But you say that like, oh, I like that little wood business that Baron started. You're ripping him. Because it's not a little, it's a huge going deal. And when you're trying to tear people down, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Paul keeps going in verse 18. What then? Now that's a weird question, right? What then? You can read that as what then are we to make of this? What's going to happen? You can, there's a lot of questions. The Greek text is delightfully ambiguous. We have no idea exactly what he's saying. There's no cool little grammatical thing where we go, oh, he's pointing back to this. He's just saying, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense, pretense would be envy and rivalry, or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that I rejoice. Wow. Now, the thing about Jesus I don't care if you're doing it for the wrong motives, partially. Because if you're out there telling people about Jesus, if you came to me and said, you know what, Pastor Mark, I hate you. I think you're a bad preacher. I think you're ugly. I think you have bad shoes. And I'm going to do everything I can to tear you down. You know how I'm going to do it? Every day I'm going to be in Annandale telling people about Jesus. I'm not going to fight you. I'll probably agree with you on some of it. But I'm like, yeah, you go. You do that. You show me. You preach Jesus. I wouldn't care, because Christ is being preached. That's why I don't get into rivalry and envy and all that stuff, because the kingdom of God will grow. Jesus is not something we have to package correctly and sell. We're giving it away for free. If you want to set up your own little outpost, knock yourself out. I'll give to it. I'll help send Bibles. I mean, who knows? Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, this is a fun word. One of my favorite old U2 songs is called Rejoice. And it's just Bono singing several times. I rejoice, I rejoice. What do you have to do before you rejoice? Rejoice. You gotta joice. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever joiced? <laughs> really, what's the word there at the root? Joy. You have to have joy to rejoice. And it doesn't mean you're recovering joy that you've lost. It means you're experiencing it again. 
Now I've got to talk about joy for just a minute here. Um, I mentioned my old boss before, Paul Knight from Hope Covenant in Grand Forks. And um, we got the news that my mom got cancer for the third time. It was uh, when we were on vacation in Florida. It was right after one of the busiest seasons of my pastoral life. And I was just crushed. And I come home. And we look at the preaching calendar. And I had been scheduled months in advance to preach in a couple weeks about joy. So I promptly asked for it off and said, yeah, I know you don't want me to do that. I'm good, right? And Paul said, nope, you're, you're up. I said, fine, now I want to preach about something else. Nope, you're preaching about joy. And I started looking for things to kill him with. Hmm. That's how I truly felt. I was ready to just went up to my office, and I informed God how wrong my boss was. And God didn't say anything. And I sat there for most of the day waiting for God to speak up and tell me how right I was that this guy was nuts. And it didn't happen. And I kept saying this one phrase, how in the world am I supposed to talk about joy when I'm so sad? a couple friends of mine, and they said affectionately, Mark, you're being an idiot. Which is just what you want to hear from friends at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm sad. I can't preach about joy. And they said, sad is not the opposite of joy. Sad is the opposite of happy. Okay, your point was what? They said, you can lose your happiness just like you can lose your sadness. But where's the source of your joy? So I started talking about my Harley. Mm. No, that wasn't it. Not Carla. No. Not my job. Not my incredible good looks. Oh, wait, this is on video. They don't mind. Um, where was my joy coming from? My joy came from the Lord. And what the Lord gives, no one can take away. I was down. I was incredibly sad. But not for one moment did I doubt my salvation. Not for one moment did I doubt God's goodness. You know what happened? A few weeks later, I got up and preached, in my opinion, one of the driest sermons I've ever done. I read it more than I preached it, and I went through what joy was biblically, why it mattered, and then I started talking about why I still had joy in the midst of my sadness. And if you tell 800 people that your mom's dying, <laughs> There's not a dry eye in the place, and that wasn't my goal. I thought it was this very stoic, unemotional, almost dictionary, this is what joy is, this is what sadness is. And it got done, and like I got mobbed as people wanted to just comfort me and console me. And it didn't take away my sadness, but it caused me to rejoice. rejoice. I experienced the joy of the Lord in my heart, and in my soul, again, even in the worst times. That's why I don't apologize sometimes when God makes you cry. I like that we're having Kleenex boxes in here. Because there's times when God's just going to get you. And he's going to move your heart. And there's times you're going to be sad. But none of that takes away from the joy of the Lord. Paul had every reason to be sad. He's in jail. We could stop there. <laughs> You know, he's, he's possibly going to be found guilty, but he knows he's done the right thing. But doing the right thing and getting free doesn't mean the same thing. He, had, he just didn't know. And, and what happens is he rejoices. And I have to say, how many of us would do that behind bars? Probably not a lot of us. Okay, let's be honest, not me probably. I'd be like, this isn't fair. And then I hear my mom's voice, who told you life was fair? Yeah, she knew what she was doing. Paul rejoices because of one thing. You look three, four words back. Christ is proclaimed. When I was in seminary, there was a professor, Gerhard Ferdi, who was a brilliant Lutheran theologian. And theology is, is the study of God. Theos is God, Logos is word or logic, and it's the words and logic of God. 
and talk about dry. If you ever can't sleep at night, grab a system, systematic theology textbook and it will put you out. I mean like Dramamine just, or Benadryl or whatever knocks you out. But he didn't buy that. He wrote a book called Theology is for Proclamation. If you study God and learn about God, it definitely lends itself to proclamation. And proclaiming is different than talking. Proclamation is preaching. Proclamation is making assertions about the very nature of God and humans and our relationship to each other. And for that, we need to go back a few verses. I just want to draw your attention a few previous verses. Um, we're going to go to verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that you so, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. You cannot encounter Paul's writings without firmly understanding that knowledge has to lead to love. That's the only way it's possible for Paul. Knowledge is not for building up ourselves. And he even says in a different letter, knowledge puffs up, love builds up. If I love Dallas, I'm not going to come at him with facts and figures and, and make myself look smarter. I'm going to love him and build him up. And he would do the same to me. That's what the congregation did when they found out about my mom. They built me up in love. They encouraged me. They surrounded me. They did not let me fall in the midst of my sadness. And I still had my joy. Paul can't separate knowledge and love. Neither can we. So when he says that he rejoices because Christ is being proclaimed, it's important. The later do it out of love, and love leads to knowledge, knowing I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely to afflict, but thinking to afflict me in my, in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. That is proclamation. That is theology. That is knowledge of God leading to love of God and love of neighbor. That's what changes the world. Nobody's ever gone up to a neighbor in a hard time and went, can I tell you all of the Greek words I know? I know four of them. Can I share them? No. Can I, can I get my chainsaw and help you cut up the tree that fell on your house after the tornado? That's love. That's the buildup that knowledge should lead to. Paul continues, he, he, but you can't pivot into 19 without the end of verse 18. He says, yes, and I will rejoice, for I know... And where does knowing come from? Knowledge. knowledge. It's this. Yep. He has knowledge of, he believes it, that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. It's easy to talk about deliverance. Uh, if you are old school minded or King James versed, some people pray for deliverance. God, deliver me from this evil, deliver me from this problem, deliver me from this pain, deliver me from this hurt, etc., etc., right? But how many of us are actually in chains? How many of us are actually imprisoned and asking God to deliver us? Paul is quite literally behind bars. And he's saying that, I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Deliverance is being set free. If you've been set free by God to begin with, you're not that concerned about being imprisoned by man. And he can proclaim, even in chains. He says in verse 20, As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed but that with full courage now as always Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death now the newsboys sang this song I'm not ashamed and they talk about being not ashamed to speak the gospel but very few people can say I'm not ashamed to die for the gospel very few people can say, for me, life and death don't matter. I want Jesus to be proclaimed. And Paul is saying that. I hate to ask this again. Do we end at 11 or 11.15? Okay. Whenever you want it. 
no, no, no. When we have kids outside, the door is banging. Oh. Um, we're going to finish, we're going to start next week with this verse 21. But he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that could be an hour if I needed it to be. I won't, though, because that would be too long. But he says, I'm not ashamed. I will not be ashamed. But that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Friends, the punishment for what Paul did isn't a fine. It's not 30 days of hard labor. It's death. If the emperor says you're guilty of violating the cult of the emperor, and that you've done things that go against that, it's not a slap on the wrist, it's death. And a cowardly Paul, or a brave Mark, would probably both act the same. Okay, I'm in chains, they're watching me. I'm definitely going to talk about the emperor. Yay, emperor, I want out. The emperor is good, I love the emperor. Do you love the emperor? I love the emperor, let's go. <laughs> and instead, Paul preaches to the emperor's guards about Jesus. And everybody else finds out about the two. Some people keep preaching Christ to hurt him more. Some people preach Christ out of hope and love. And he says, either way, I don't care because Christ is preached. And in the end, I will not be ashamed. And I don't care whether I even die. Life or death, not the point. That's a tough place to stop. But it's a great place to start whatever we do over the next six days. Preach the gospel in and out of season, in all places, to all men, and women, and do so because you can have joy in the fact that you've been saved, and you don't have to be ashamed when you're called to give an account of that. Let's pray. Lord, may your word dwell in our hearts. Let us richly hold to it. Let us follow you with all we do. We ask for your help. We ask for your blessing. Thank you for a wonderful morning, praising you and singing your glory. Thank you for the gift of your word and our ability to study it freely without fear of death or persecution. Help us to always put you first, not being ashamed, so that your word would go forth and more people would know about you. Help us not to build up our knowledge for ourselves, but to build up our knowledge so that we may abound more in love 